Hello and welcome to another episode of the Voice of Wealth podcast. My name is Charlotte de Capuisson. Today, Ed Ching, Global Chief Investment Officer from BNP Paribas Wealth Management, joins me for this interview. Hello and welcome, Ed. Good day to you, Charlotte. Sushi, sumo, tea parties, geisha, manga, electronics. Yes, you guessed it. Today, we're going to discuss Japan. Ed, apparently you have quite an interest in Japan. I know you like Japanese cuisine and you've traveled there a few times, unlike me. What struck you most about the country when you last visited it? Well, I think, Charlotte, that it's a fascinating culture. Not only, of course, the food, which I love, but uh, all the other aspects of the culture. Um, the films they make, which are really quite different. The way they act, the sort of the extreme politeness of the society, but the very strict rules. Um, and in many ways, the technology, the impressive technology, for instance, like the Shinkansen, which is the bullet train, which is very impressive when you travel on it. Um, there are many aspects of Japan which I find fascinating, but at the same time, quite impenetrable. The language is, of course, very difficult to master, and I've not even tried. Um, my children have, but certainly not me. And also, um, many aspects of Japanese culture is quite, are quite insular and a little bit alien to those of us from the West. And Japan has quite an atypical economy, an extremely low unemployment rate, gigantic public debt and deflation. Japan's GDP per capita real growth between 1960 and 2018 was 3.04%, and it is growing more than other countries. By comparison, world GDP growth over the same period was 1.85%, so not all bad news. But Japan has atypical demographics too, with an aging population. What economic challenges does all this bring? Well, I think you're right. On a per person basis, Japan has actually grown surprisingly well over the last 50 odd years. However, in recent years, the challenge has been, as you've pointed out, the aging demographics, more importantly, the shrinking labor force. There are fewer and fewer people working, more and more people are retired. And that is a huge challenge for the, for the economy because at the end of the day, economic growth for an economy is generally a combination of growth in productivity plus growth in the size of the labor force. And Japan's labor force has been shrinking, which presents a huge challenge. Now, normally you'd combat that by raising the birth rate and by um, increasing immigration, but the Japanese have done neither of those. Um, in fact, immigration rates in Japan remain incredibly low uh, for the moment. But what they have done is they have uh, boosted the participation of women in the workforce, for instance, to a great extent, and that certainly has helped. But now they need to enact further structural reforms in the economy to uh, increase productivity further to get economic growth going again. And Mr. Suga was sworn in as the country's 99th prime minister at the age of 71 last year. How do you think he will successfully carry out his reforms to spur growth in Japan? Well, I think he has a heck of a challenge ahead of him, that's for sure. Sort of carrying on the, the mantle of Arbonomics is going to be a tough one. Um, but again, with the recovery in the world economy, that certainly is going to help to some extent Japan, because Japan is a very export driven economy. So of course, the better that the rest of the world does, the better Japan will do as well by, by token of their, the, the exports. Um, I think also, the fortunes of Japanese companies are very much linked to China because a lot of production of, from Japanese companies is actually done in China these days. And of course, China has become an increasingly big end market for Japanese products as well. So I think Chinese growth is very important to spur Japan onwards. But I, again, I come back to these structural reforms. There's too much bureaucracy in Japan, for instance. They need to make, uh, they need to simplify a lot of their bureaucracy to strip out a lot of these um, barriers and bottlenecks to growth and productivity. And I think in addition to that, they actually do need to uh, embrace technology even more in their economy going forward. So I'm thinking about areas such as industrial automation, where they are already world well leaders, but they need to use even more going forward. And I think um, these are the challenges that Prime Minister Suga has on his plate at the moment. The Japanese authorities were criticized in the way they handled the COVID-19 crisis at the outset. But in hindsight, Japan understood the virus better than most. 
And when we look at the, the figures, in fact, um, cases and deaths are amongst the lowest among the world's big, biggest economies. At the time of recording, Japan had registered under 500,000 cases of COVID-19 and fewer than 10,000 deaths, compared with over 5 million cases and over 10,000 deaths in France, for example. So I'm wondering, what, what is their secret in doing this? Well, I think firstly, they are quite an insular economy. So unlike Europe, where we have the Schengen zone and therefore free movement of people, which has been obviously um, not a good thing at a time of COVID in terms of uh, transmission rates, um, it's been much harder to get in and out of Japan. So it's not as easy. It is an island. But on top of that, it has quite stringent immigration controls, number one. Number two, um, as a population, they're very used to wearing masks because even during flu season, or hay fever season in the spring, people wearing masks in the street were a very common occurrence in Japan. And that's pretty much the only economy where I can think that that, that has been the case historically before COVID. Um, and thirdly, they did have experience, like many other Asian countries, of dealing with these severe respiratory diseases like SARS in the past. And so, again, I think they were quite quick to put measures into action to try to control outbreaks and to try to get, tell people to avoid crowded places uh, and to wear masks and to wash and to and of course the Japanese are pretty scrupulous about the hygiene as well so um, I think that's important and the final point I think is that the Japanese are really generally quite you know, they're quite law-abiding they do follow rules that they're given and I think that has helped as well so I think it's a combination of all of these factors that has at least to now kept Japan uh, Japan's COVID cases relatively low. And on a different topic now, Japan pledges to be carbon neutral by 2050. Sorry about the pun, but do you think this goal is sustainable? Well, it's going to be difficult. Japan's carbon footprint is actually quite high at the moment. Remember that they do not have any domestic sources of fossil fuels, neither oil nor gas. And so all of this has to be imported uh, from abroad. So actually, that gives Japan quite a good incentive to wean themselves off this import these imported fossil fuels. However, this cannot be achieved, in my view, using solar and wind power alone, or even if you add hydroelectric, it still won't be enough. Ultimately, um, the question of nuclear power comes to the fore. If they want to be net zero in terms of carbon emissions in the next few decades, I think they will need to re-embrace nuclear power. Now, obviously, in the wake of Fukushima 10 years ago, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be a challenge and probably is quite an unpopular view. But I think ultimately, um, this is the way to go, to restart some of the nuclear reactors and even maybe to build at some future point smaller nuclear reactors with more modern technology to um, allow the Japanese to get away from the usage of fossil fuels. But in some cases, I think they are well advanced. Electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles is certainly one area where the Japanese car makers are very far advanced compared to most other car makers in the world. Now, we cannot talk about Japan without talking about technology a very important industry there. What do the Japanese particularly excel at, do you think? Well, they excel at, excel at a number of areas. I mean, in software, for instance, they, are, they still excel in areas such as video games, surprisingly enough, whether it be Sony, Sega, Square Enix, or so on, with SoftBank. So uh, I think video games and the future of entertainment is a very strong area. Industrial automation, I've mentioned, as well as a second very strong area. A third very strong area are electric and hybrid vehicles. And even, of course, uh, looking at hydrogen-powered vehicles, where com companies like Toyota have certainly taken a lead. So there are a number of key areas of technology going forwards, which I think will be very important for the future of the world economy over the next decade or two, where Japanese are amongst the world leaders today. And Ed, in your investment themes for 2021, published last December, your strategy team introduced Japan as one of your favourite countries from an investment point of view. What were the main reasons for doing this? And by extension, what are the hidden pearls in Japan? Well, after long-term underperformance of the Japanese stock market, really since 1989, remember, even today, the Japanese stock market is something like 25% plus below its 1989 peak, even today, uh, and that is over 30 years later. Uh, it is a value market, so it's really relatively cheap. Profitability of Japanese companies has improved markedly over the last few uh, years, driven by uh, government initiatives to improve profitability um, and growth. And on top of that, dividend payments and share buybacks have accelerated as a result. Now, all of that is 
a very important driver. On top of that, you can say that balance sheets of Japanese companies are very, very strong. They were cash rich. So, of course, they actually survived the COVID crisis rather well because of their cash reserves. So all of that has made us pretty positive on the outlook for Japan. Again, we expect strong Chinese growth and strong world growth going forward. And for export-led companies, which dominate the Japanese stock market, we think that they will continue to do well, grow profits, and increase dividends and share buybacks going forward. So those are the main reasons for liking the Japanese stock market at the moment. And that is not to mention Japanese small caps, such as the Tokyo Mothers Index, where you see a lot of very innovative companies which are have been to a large degree overlooked up to now. Ed Ching, thank you very much for your time. It was a fascinating interview. See you soon. Thank you, Charlotte. Goodbye. <laughs>